doing right now. All right, hey everybody. Welcome to the Wichita Audubon Society program meeting for what month is this? February, <laughs> somehow already. I'm Rachel Roth. I'm the vice president of the Wichita Audubon Society. And we have a really great program for you tonight on this very cold evening. So I hope you're bundled up under some blankets and ready to learn some amazing things about native bees tonight. So I have Alex Morphier with me tonight and I'm gonna let her introduce herself and her presentation. Um, but we don't have any announcements tonight for the Audubon Society. We're not having any bird walks because it's way too cold for that. Uh, so yeah, I suppose we'll just jump right into the presentation. Um, one note though, for anybody that has questions during the presentation, just put them in the chat, whether you're looking on Facebook or YouTube. And I'm keeping track of all of those comments and we'll make sure that Alex gets a chance to answer those questions at the end. Cool. So Alex, take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I wish I could see all of your lovely faces, but um, since I cannot, I am going to go ahead and put up my PowerPoint. Um, forgive me for stopping the video here. I'm not sure I can look at myself while presenting, <laughs> but I will be back on uh, at the end for all of your questions. All right, so. Can everybody see that? Does that look okay? Okay. All right. So hi everybody, um, my name is Alex Morphew and I am uh, currently in Sydney, Montana, which is very cold. Uh, and I'm sure that you are also all extremely chilled as well, but we were at like negative 40 the other, uh, the other day. So <laughs> anyway, count your lucky stars if you're not up here in the great north with me. Um, but today I am going to be presenting, um, I'm going to be presenting some um, of my preliminary results from my master's thesis research at Wichita State University. Now, a little bit about me um, before I jump into it. I first got started studying native bees when I was an undergraduate at uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, and I was fortunate enough to be a part of a research group looking at native bees on Colorado CRP and rangeland. Um, and I just loved it so much that I went right into grad school at Wichita State University. And I got to work with more amazing researchers uh, looking at more native bees on grasslands and CRP. So clearly there's a theme here. Um, <laughs> after I graduated with my master's in 2019, I worked with the Missouri Department of Conservation in 2020 and we did a sand prairie bee research project. So switching it up a little bit. Um, and then I took a job up here in Sydney, Montana, where I am currently a, a permanent biological science technician for the USDA Agricultural Research Service um, in a pollinator lab. And this is truly a dream come true because I get to do research 100% of the time. Um, so I'm so pleased to be here with you today and revisit some of the um, some of the work that I did in Kansas, which I, I find to be very exciting. So I hope you do as well. All right, so here's a brief overview of what I'll be talking about tonight. Now, before getting into my research, I'll first give you some background on native bees and their conservation status. Uh, then I'll get into my research questions, how we conducted our study, and I'll show some preliminary results for what we have found so far. Pardon me. Um, so finally, I'll do my best to interpret these results from a conservation point of view and talk about the next steps moving forward, as well as some of the most significant and overlooked aspects of conducting bee research in general. Now, my good friend Molly, who was a major contributor to my research in Kansas, took this picture, and it's one of my favorites in the entire presentation, so you'll see it a couple times. Um, but thank you so much for letting me use this glorious photo, Molly. 
Now, I find that in general, not a lot of people realize that there are over 20,000 species of bees in the world, with more than 4,000 in the United States alone. Honeybees uh, thus only represent 0.00005% of global bee diversity. I also feel it's important to clear up a common misconception that in North America, honeybees are not native. Now, the species of honeybee that's found in the US is Apis mellifera, and it was introduced from Europe. Oh gosh, now you get a, an entire overview of my presentation. Many apologies. Anyway, uh, Apis mellifera was introduced from Europe and has been domesticated for the purpose of providing pollination services for a large scale crop production. Now I get a lot of questions about whether honeybee colony declines are creating a pollinator crisis. Um, I prefer to think of the current situation less as a crisis and more as a learning opportunity about the sustainability of our current agricultural practices like monocropping and mass crop production. Um, if we make a shift towards more sustainable land use and agriculture, we could begin to once again engage with our natural ecosystems and benefit from the free pollination services that are provided by native bees. Now, it is a little known fact that native bees are excellent pollinators of both crops and wild plants. They have even been shown to be better pollinators than honeybees, given that they forage across a wider range of temperatures and landscapes, provide buzz pollination services that honeybees don't, deposit more grains of pollen per flower than do honeybees, and are mostly solitary and less likely to spread disease. So this is just to name a few. So native bees are really important because they possess a wide range of life history traits that contribute greatly to the stability of pollination services in both natural and agricultural ecosystems. Because native bees have a wide range of floral preference, there are typically many bee species that will visit a single type of flower. Um, this is called redundancy, which is a really essential component to the stability of pollination services. Now, diverse native bee communities also contain species that will forage throughout the year, um, and this contributes to what we call temporal pollination stability, which is basically stability across time. Finally, wild bees have a wide range of nesting habitats from below ground chambers to above ground cavities and the voids of pithy stems. Uh, this minimizes the limitation of nesting resources, um, which contributes to spatial pollination stability. So that's stability across space. Now, because bee diverse bee communities provide essential pollination services, Native bee declines pose a pretty serious threat to pollination stability. Thus far, uh, numerous studies have de detected native bee, uh, sorry, uh, native bee population losses and evidence for widespread declines. So we're going to get kind of sad here for a second. Bear with me. Um, one study in 2006 found that uh, in the UK and the Netherlands, the number of bee species has declined by more than 60%. Now, these declines were also paralleled by the loss of bee pollinated plants. Co et al., um, who is a really brilliant researcher, conducted a meta analysis that found declines in wild bee abundance across 23% of um, land area in the US. These losses were primarily associated with the conversion of natural habitat to row crop. Yet another study found severe losses in native bee diversity and abundance around farms that were generally isolated from any natural habitat. So uh, I think the title of this 2011 paper really sums it up quite well. It's called the stability of pollination services decreases with isolation from natural areas despite honeybee visits. Real catchy title, huh? This basically means that wild pollinators are essential to pollination stability and natural areas are essential to sustaining wild pollinator populations. So we can't have one without the other. Now these findings point us towards a larger trend that's especially relevant to bees in the Midwest and the Great Plains. Now throughout the world, large scale agricultural practices are responsible for substantial native bee losses. 
Agricultural intensification leads to habitat fragmentation and loss, which results in homogenized landscapes, generally void of natural habitat. Now this means that nesting habitat for bees is destroyed and floral resources are removed, thus resulting in the native bee declines that we've been seeing. Now in the US, the most extreme land use conversion for agricultural purposes can be found in the Great Plains region. Um, here you'll see the historic extent of native prairies outlined in black with currently remaining untilled land in green. Now in the eastern portion of this area, tall grass prairies have experienced the most severe losses, um, which have totaled up to 99% in some parts. Now, given this, bee declines in the U.S. are expected to be most severe in these Great Plains states, which, as you can see, unfortunately includes Kansas. Now, overall, we can say that bees require two things, foraging resources and nesting habitat. Although we understand somewhat the nesting habits of bees, um, the specific requirements are known for less than a quarter of all bee species. Now, given this gap in our understanding, a majority of native bee conservation efforts do focus more on providing foraging resources through habitat restoration, since we know considerably more about the floral requirements of bees. So providing foraging resources for pollinators really means establishing habitat with diverse and abundant flowering forbs. Now, the most successful pollinator habitat will have floral communities with native species that flower throughout the season um, in order to support phenologically diverse pollinator communities. Planting native forbs benefits not only bees and pollinators, but also plant communities, birds, and um, plenty of other grassland taxa. So recently, um, one of the largest grassland effort, restoration efforts in the country, the Conservation Reserve Program, which I will refer to as the CRP, uh, has joined the effort to conserve native pollinators through the establishment of pollinator habitat. Now, the CRP was created by the USDA in 1985, and it essentially leases marginal cropland from farmers to be converted into conservation planting for about 10 to 15 years. Now, goals of the CRP uh, initially targeted improving water quality and preventing soil erosion, um, but they have since expanded to include reducing loss of wildlife habitat and creating pollinator habitat. So this is uh, achieved primarily through the reestablishment of valuable land cover. Now, the type of restoration that um, the CRP implements on a given parcel of land is determined by the conservation practice which I'll call CP from here on out. Um, and a CP is uh, a specific CP is a, assigned to a parcel of land by the NRCS. Now each CP has its own set of specific conservation goals, uh, which are targeted through prescribed seeding mixes and min contract management options, such as burning, grazing, disking, spraying, interseeding, and haying. So while there is a, a conservation practice called CP42 that was developed specifically for establishing pollinator habitat, low rental payments and the high costs of required seeding mixes make enrollment in this practice fairly uncommon. Fortunately, uh, there is another practice to the rescue, which includes in its goals the establishment of pollinator habitat to supply nutritional resources for pollinators. So this conservation practice is called CP25, and it is implemented on land that is um, defined as rare and declining habitat by the NRCS. Now in Kansas, there are over 600,000 acres of CP25 enrolled land, which is actually 100 times that of the land that's enrolled currently in CP42, which is the pollinator specific planting. Okay, so in Kansas, uh, the habitats that are designated by the NRCS as rare and declining for CP25 plantings are sand, uh, sorry, sand, sand, sage, short grass, mixed grass, and tall grass prairies. Try saying that five times fast. Um, and these are the primary grassland ecoregions in the state. 
So given the amount of land devoted to CP25 in Kansas, uh, this practice could be immensely important in the mitig mitigation of native bee declines. However, very little research so far has been done to verify that CP25 restoration successfully establish um, pollinator habitat. So that's where my research comes in. So the primary objective of my study was to determine the key factors driving native bee community responses to grassland restoration pr uh, practices in Kansas. So this research was part of a larger project studying the effects of CRP management on plants, birds, and insects. And in this system, plants provide food for insects and birds, as well as shelter and nesting habitat. Additionally, insects are an essential component of bird diets. So my study focuses on the native bee communities and their mutualistic relationships with floral communities across multiple grassland ecoregions on Kansas CRP land. So in this study, I focused on the effects of two components of CRP management on native bee communities. Um, the first component is restoration type. So when I talk about restoration type in air quotes, uh, in, the context, in the context of this study, I'm referring to the conservation practice or CP um, on our CRP lands. Now our sites were split between two different conservation practices um, CP25 on the right here and CP2 on the left. Now, as you'll remember, CP25 is the restoration type which included pollinator habitat in its conservation goals. So for simplicity's sake, I'll refer to this as the forb enhanced planting. And um, for anybody that is not hip with lingo or whatnot, um, forb basically means flowers um, for the purpose of this study. So we will, I'll refer to CP25 as forb enhanced plantings because land enrolled in this, uh, in CP25 is seeded with four to 15 native flower species when it is first converted uh, into a CP25 CRP land. So alternatively, I will refer to CP2 as a grass planting because land enrolled in CP2 is primarily seeded with native grass species. So overall, CP2 is considered um, a low diversity planting and CP2 a high diversity planting relative to one another. Additionally, um, I assess the effects of grazing on native bees. Now, grasslands of the Great Plains are historically adapted to grazing by large herbivores, including bison. Today, uh, grazing by bison is less common, having, having largely been replaced by cattle. Thus, we implemented an experimental grazing treatment on approximately half of the CRP fields in our study. Currently, grazing is an allowable management option for CP2 grass plantings, but it is largely disincentivized through reduced rental payments. Thus, grazing is not commonly utilized as a mid-contract management practice. So, um, Oh gosh, sorry. So despite the adaptations of our grasslands to large grazers, uh, grazing has not previously been permitted on CP25. Um, oh, sorry, has previously not been <laughs> permitted on CP25 for enhanced plantings. Given the potential, um, but so far largely unexplored benefits that grazing could provide for grassland ecosystems, CP25 landowners participating in our study were permitted um, to graze cattle so that we could study the effects. So thanks so much to those landowners and to the NRCS for letting that happen. Um, I would also like to note that since the completion of this project in 2019, grazing was included as a permissible mid-contract management option on all CRP land. So I think I can speak for all of the researchers and myself with whom I collaborated on this project uh, when I say that we are super excited to contribute to a greater understanding of how this new development in CRP policy will influence uh, CRP grassland ecosystems. Now for this study, uh, we implemented our experimental grazing treatment in which half of participating CRP fields were grazed at a stocking rate that targeted a 50% reduction in plant biomass. So basically 
we expected cows to eat half of all the plants that were on the CRP. The other half of the CRP fields uh, were left ungrazed for the duration of this, of this study. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information, so let's revisit our primary research objective. So going into this study, um, my main goal was to identify key factors driving native bee community responses to grassland restoration management practices in the agroecosystems of Kansas. Now, in order to address this objective, um, we wanted to see how native bee communities differed between our two conservation practices, CP2 and CP25. We predicted that borb enhanced restorations would support more diverse and abundant floral communities and subsequently more diverse and abundant native bees. We also wanted to know how cattle grazing affected our native bee communities on CRP lands. We predicted um, that given historical adaptations of grassland plants to grazing, grazing would ultimately benefit for communities through the removal of competitive grass species and subsequently lead to increased native bee abundance and diversity. Finally, we wanted to know how native bee responses to CP and grazing differed across our four Kansas East ecoregions. Now, because sand, short, mixed, and tall grass prairies vary substantially in their abiotic and biotic conditions, we predicted that forb and bee community responses to grazing and restoration type would differ somewhat across ecoregions. So now for our methods, and there's my favorite picture again. So we surveyed 108 sites given here in yellow and red across 650 kilometers of Kansas. These uh, white lines indicate annual precipitation isoclines based on 30 year averages. And you can see that our study spans a majority of this precipitation gradient from about 42 centimeters in the Western short grass prairies to the left uh, to 110 centimeters per year in the tall grass prairies of the East, which you would see all the way to the right on this map. Now, of the 105 counties in Kansas, our sites spanned 32 of them, which I promise you is no small feat. Additionally, our sites were split between CP2 and CP25 contracts, as well as our grazing treatment. And grazing occurred in 2017 and 2018, but not in 2019. Finally, all of our sites were distributed across these four grassland ecoregions, which are short grass, and I'm going from left to right here, um, short grass, mixed grass, sand prairie, and tall grass ecoregions. Now these CRP fields, um, which you can see outlined in black here, are set within agriculturally dominated landscapes. Also, I forgot about my uh, mouse pointer, so I'm not sure if everybody can see it, but I'll keep using it um, and pretend like you can. So I think we can. Just, oh, great. Okay. Thank you so much, Rachel. Sure. <laughs> oh, good. This will help hopefully everybody understand things better as we move forward. Okay, so within each CRP field, we established a uh, 150 by 200 meter sampling plot with nine equally spaced sampling points. We then split the pot, oh, oh, okay, here we go. We then split the plot into two sampling transects, which were each 75 meters wide by 200 meters long. Now on each half of our transects, uh, we, we walked a meandering transect for 15 minutes, locating flowers and netting them for bees. So CRP fields were sampled for bees twice between May and July in 2018 and 2019. After two years, each plot was netted for a total of one hour in the morning and one hour in the afternoon. Now I do want to say that in an ideal world, we would have visited our plots more frequently throughout the year and spent a greater amount of time collecting. Um, however, given that this project also included plant and bird components, components um, in addition to 108 whole sites, nine technicians, 
two years and extremely temperamental Kansas weather, uh, we really had to pick and choose our battles wisely. So we did spend a total of 216 hours collecting bees over the two years of this project. And uh, I would like to say that we were certainly not lacking for effort. Okay, so back in the lab, we fluffed, pinned, labeled, and identified to genus and species every single bee collected across the two years of the study. Now, this is always a good question that I get. What does it mean to fluff a bee? So after bees are caught in a net with stray flowers and other insects, uh, they typically come out pretty matted and dirty um, and not cute at all. But because bee identification requires looking closely at hair color, length, and structure, we have to wash and dry them, um, wash them and then dry them with a hair dryer in order to fluff up their hair and restore them to their original fuzzy states. Um, it's, it's quite an ordeal. Okay, so in order to analyze our bee communities, um, I had to sum them up with a few simple measures just to make make things a little bit more manageable. So the first measure that I used was bee abundance, which is just the number of bees collected per site during each year of the study. Now, a second measure uh, was bee genera richness, which is the number of unique bee genera that I found on each site, that I found, that we all found together through a large amount of effort. Um, lastly, I quantified the effective genera number as a measure of bee diversity. Um, so this effective gender number essentially just weighs diversity by genera frequency without any bias used towards rare or common genera, which makes each measure of diversity directly comparable um, against one another. So in addition to netting for bees, we surveyed the flowering forbs on each of our plots. And again, forbs, just flowers, essentially. We set a one by one meter vegetation quadrat at each of the nine sampling points on our plots. And within, within each quadrat, we identified all flowering forbs um, to species and quantified their percent cover. So I'll take this opportunity to thank Esben, who's at the top here and Fraser at the bottom um, for all the time and expertise that they lent to this portion of the project, especially I would be lost without all of their hard work. So we used two measures of floral resources in, um, in these analyses. Floral cover is the first, and it's basically an estimation of abundance that quantifies the relative area of one of our vegetation quadrats um, that's occupied by flowers. So in each year of the study, we averaged the floral cover across all quadrats sampled on a given plot. Now, the second measure I used was floral species richness, which is basically a count of the number of unique flower species observed on each site during each year of the study. Now, I don't want to spend too much time getting into this uh, into the statistical analyses I used for this portion of my research, um, since they are really complicated and not anywhere near as exciting as the results themselves. So to summarize, um, I used multi-model inference and model averaging to assess our univariate bee community responses of bee abundance, richness, and diversity to our CRP treatments. Now I analyzed the bee communities from 2018 and 2019 separately in order to see if there were any differences in our in post-grazing bee communities. Now, since CRP fields were not grazed um, in 2019, then all of the 2019 results that you see can be considered post grazing for the purposes of this presentation, at least. So again, our measures of bee community responses are the abundance, general richness, and diversity. Now we can separate our primary predictor variables into two groups. So the treatments um, are CP, ecoregion, and grazing. And the, you can find these on the left here. Our measures of floral resources were floral cover and floral richness. Now, um, it's possible that the effects of these predictor variables are not necessarily independent of one another. Um, so I tested the effects of their interactions on our bee response measures. So if you want to know more about the specifics of my analyses, please feel free to email me 
uh, with your questions following my presentation, you can ask me as well, but I'm not sure how eloquently um, I will be able to explain them in a short amount of time. All right, so given our time constraints, um, I'm really only gonna be showing you the significant results from this study so far. So you can just go ahead and assume that these are the most exciting parts of the research. So across both years of the study, we collected 10,970 bees belonging to 40 different bee genera. And interestingly enough, we collected 2,372 more bees in 2019 than we did in 2018. Okay, additionally, uh, with the help of the incredibly talented Mike Arduzer, um, we identified all of our bees to species or morphospecies. Of the 433 bee species that are cataloged in this wonderful a uh, recently released publication called The Bees in Kansas, um, which is written by Michael Engel at the University of Kansas. Um, uh, of the 433 bees that he published here, 94 of them were captured in our study. So you can see that's a pretty good chunk of the pie. Now, in addition to these 94 species, we collected 16 that are not included on the published list of bees in Kansas. Um, of these 16 species, 12 have unpublished Kansas records, while the remaining four are potential state records, although this assumption does require further investigation, but I feel pretty, pretty excited about, um, about this finding. So unfortunately, given the time and resources required to identify bees to species, um, which is no small hurdle, I'll tell you that much. Um, I was unable to analyze our species level data for the purposes of this presentation. Um, so today I'll really only be presenting the genus level results, but please keep your eyes open for our species level results, which will be published sometime in the near-ish future, hopefully sooner rather than later. Okay, here we have the overall genus level composition of our CRPB communities. So on the x-axis down here, you'll find the 40 bee genera we collected over two years ranked by abundance, which is given on the y-axis. Now you'll see that these bee communities are comprised of a few highly abundant genera and many uncommon or rare genera, which is pretty typical of bee communities in general. Now the top four most abundant genera represented 85% of all bees collected. All these genera of, of these four um, belong to the same family, Halictidae, or the sweat bee family. Additionally, these groups contain many species which nest in social and semi-social aggregations, which likely explains their high abundance. Alternatively, we collected only one individual in each of these four genera, Ashmediella and Dianthidium, which are mostly above ground cavity nesters and Epiolus and zero molecta, which are kleptoparasitic bees. Now you'll remember that this guy here is Ashmediella Gilletti, which is a Kansas state record. And I do feel very certain about that one. Now in general, we have, uh, we found fairly low abundances of kleptoparasitic genera. Because these bees are in the highest trophic level of native bee communities, kleptoparasites are often used as indicators of the quality of a given habitat. So that we found so few kleptoparasitic bees may indicate that some of our CRP fields are not excellent habitat for native bees. Although we did find um, a majority of the kleptoparasitic bee genera in, um, that are found in this area. Okay, so let's revisit just briefly um, the framework for our statistical analyses. We have our predictor variables, which are treatment variables of restoration type, ecoregion, grazing, and their interactions, as well as our floral resource variables of floral cover, which is a proxy for abundance and floral richness, as well as the interaction between the two. Now, prior to conducting my analyses, I first had to determine whether or not any of our predictor variables were correlated um, in order to avoid overstating their effects on our bee communities. 
Now, I found that both measures of the floral communities were significantly and positively correlated with grazing in 2019 after cattle were no longer active. So this means that both floral cover and floral richness were significantly greater on grazed plots compared with ungrazed plots. Additionally, uh, we found that our floral measures were correlated with ecoregion in both years of the study. This means that flower cover and species richness differed significantly across our four ecoregions. Now, interestingly, uh, in contradiction to our predictions, we found that neither floral cover nor floral richness were significantly correlated with restoration type. So here you'll see flower cover and flower richness on our Y axis. Uh, with restoration type on the X, and we have 2018 on the left, 2019 on the right. While we expected to see more abundant and diverse flowers on CP25 plantings, which again are FORB enhanced compared with CP2, that was not the case. There was no difference between floral abundance or species richness um, on CP25 versus CP2. Okay, so first I'll talk about the significant patterns that we observed for bee abundance. Here you'll find the two conservation practices, CP2 and CP25 on the X axis with bee abundance on the Y. Um, so by this plot, we can see that bee abundance in 2018 was greater on forb enhanced CP25 restorations compared with our CP2 grass plantings. And this is consistent with our initial predictions. So again, we have bee, bee abundance for 2018 on the y-axis, but instead um, of CP, we have floral cover on the x-axis. And you can see that there was a positive effect of floral cover on bee abundance in 2018. This value um, up here, the R squared value, indicates that 18% of the vari variation in bee abundance can be explained by floral cover. So although this, uh, this number might not seem very high in the field of ecology, we call that not too bad. Okay, so this time we have ecoregion on the x-axis um, and this time, and, and it's bee abundance in 2019 on the y for this plot. So for ecoregion, bee abundance in 2019 was highest on short grass prairie sites, um, especially compared with the sand prairie sites and tall grass prairie sites. So more bees in short grass prairie than um, almost all other ecoregions. Additionally, uh, bee abundance in 2019 was greatest on our grays plot shown in dark gray here. Um, compared with our ungrazed plots, and this difference was significant. So now I will present the significant trends we observed in B genera richness. Okay, so for these next few slides, we will see the richness on the y-axis instead of the abundance. Um, and here I'm only going to be talking about 2018 richness, at least on this specific slide, um, and we have floral cover on the x-axis. Now we saw a positive effect of floral cover on bee richness in 2018. Um, again, we have an R squared of 0.18, which is just a coincidence, but we do have a positive slope um, when we're looking at the effect of floral cover on bee richness. Now bees responded to grazing most distinctly at the ecoregion level and bee richness was especially affected by grazing on sand prairie fields. So here we can see that bee richness in, on sand prairies uh, was significantly greater on grazed fields compared with ungrazed fields. And again, this is in 2019, the year following grazing. So finally, let's see what happened with bee diversity. This time we're looking at bee diversity on the y-axis. Um, and here we see the effect of mean floral cover on bee diversity in 2019. We saw a much stronger positive effect of, of floral cover on bee diversity on our forb enhanced restorations in red here. 
than we did on grass plantings given in blue. Um, and you can see you can see this difference by the relative steepness of the lines and the higher R squared value for CP25 effects. So again, we saw a distinct effect of grazing on bee diversity at the ecoregion level. Graze plots in the mixed grass prairie ecoregion supported significantly fewer bees than did our ungrazed plots in 2019. So let's revisit our initial predictions going into this study. We firstly expected that orb enhanced restorations would support more diverse and abundant floral resources and subsequently more diverse and abundant native bees. Now, interestingly enough, despite the intentional inclusion of multiple native dwarf species in our initial seeding mixes, neither floral cover nor floral richness were significantly greater on orb enhanced CP25 restorations when compared to CP2 grass plantings. However, uh, despite the lack of effect uh, of CP on our floral resource measures, we did see some positive effects on our bee community. Specifically, uh, bee abundance was greater on CP25 plots in 2018, and these orb enhanced restorations had a marginally positive effect on bee richness in 2019. Okay, so in this diagram, the red circle represents CP25 and the blue is CP2. You can see that there was quite a lot of overlap in the genera uh, we found on both CP25 and CP2 fields. In fact, this was true for a majority of the genera we observed. On CP2 plots, we caught two unique bee genera not found on our form enhanced plantings or CP25. On the other hand, we caught 10 unique bee genera, unique uh, 10 bee genera that were unique to our CP25 plots. Now of these, of these 10 genera, all were found in relatively low abundance and were mostly nest specialists floral specialists or kleptoparasites, which can be indicators of high quality bee habitat. So here's a good question. Why did we see a positive effect of CP25 on bees if there was no correlation with CP25 and either of our floral resource measures? In order to answer that question, um, I have some fairly complicated plots to show you, but I hope you'll bear with me. Firstly, you need to know, though, that in 2018, 54% of our bees were collected on tall grass prairie fields, and the top 10 most abundant plots were primarily CP25. So just like a whole ton of bees caught in tall grass prairies, and most of that was on CP25. So additionally, uh, floral cover was a primary driver of all of our bee response measures in 2018. Okay. So bear with me here. We have um, I'm, these plots show the total cover of the dominant, most abundant flowering forbs in 2018 by eco region, which you can see on the x axis, restoration type, which you can see CP2 on the left and CP25 on the right, and forb species, which are given by these various colored blocks. Now, on the y axis, we have total floral cover. Um, and again, ecoregion is on the X. Okay, so when we look at the identities of the most abundant dominant species, we can clearly see that on CP2 grass plantings, two species of sweet clover, both of which are represented by these yellow blocks here, are found in pretty high abundance on each three on on three of the four ecoregions. And this includes tall grass prairies. So we have lots of sweet clover in short grass prairies, mixed grass prairies and tall grass prairies to your pea plots. Now sweet clover is not native to Kansas or even to North America and is often considered to be a weedy invader. On CP25 fields, which are shown here on the right, we still see sweet clover in, in the short grass prairie region, but in the tall grass prairie ecoregion, where a majority of our bees were collected, there is clearly a high amount of cover of both Illinois bundle flower and annual fleabane, 
both of which are native to Kansas. Now, many studies have shown that in disturbed habitats, and particularly those of low quality, bees will use non-native floral resources, but they definitely don't compare them if they have the choice to use native flowers. Thus, the high cover of native flowering forbs on tall grass CP25 plots may have been the reason why we saw a positive significant effect on bee abundance in 2018. All right, so um, the second prediction that we had was that grazing would augment CRP floral resources and thus increase native bee abundance and diversity. Now we saw that floral cover and floral richness were both strongly and positively affected by grazing, but only in 2019. Bee abundance was also strongly and positively affected by grazing in 2019, but bee diversity responded negatively to grazing, although this effect was weak. Okay, finally, our last prediction was that flower and bee communities would respond to differently to grazing and restoration depending on ecoregion. Now we did see uh, pretty significant differences between forb and bee communities across our four ecoregions. In particular, we observed an interesting pattern in sand prairie this pattern in sand prairie bees and forbs. Overall, floral cover on sand prairie fields was consistently low compared with other ecoregions, which you can see here in the red boxes. But flower richness was greater than or comparable to other ecoregions. So we've got low cover but high richness of flowers in sand prairie um, CRP fields. Now we saw similar trends in sand prairie bee abundance and diversity in 2019, with bee abundance being lowest in our sand prairie fields. However, bee diversity, again, is comparable to other ecoregions in 2019. So overall, low abundance of sand prairie bees and forbs, but relatively high richness and diversity. So um, again, we did find that um, the forb and bee communities responded to grazing differently across ecoregions. Um, but not necessarily differently to restoration type um, across our four acre regions. So the effects of grazing were most distinct at the eco region level. Now in 2018, floral cover was somewhat negatively affected by grazing across all eco regions except sand prairies. Now remember, floral cover was the most important driving factor of our native bee communities. So in 2019, when cattle were no longer actively grazing, floral cover on grazed plots was mostly higher compared with ungrazed plots, except in the mixed grass ecoregion. Now this difference was significant for short grass and tall grass prairie fields as well. The effects of grazing in ecoregion on bee communities were only detectable in 2019 as well. So overall, bee richness responded to the effects of grazing somewhat positively in all of our ecoregions, except for mixed grass prairies. So these, so these differences were not significant. A bee diversity, on the other hand, was split in the direction of um, response to grazing. So on sand and tall grass prairie fields, bee diversity responded positively, which you can see here. Oops. Um, though this effect was not strong. So on short and mixed grass fields, bee diversity was negatively affected and the difference between ungrazed and grazed diversity was significant for our mixed grass prairie fields. So again, we have lower bee diversity um, on grazed fields in the mixed grass prairie ecoregion. So what does this mean for our ecoregional effects of grazing overall? Across the board, Mixed grass prairie bees and forests were negatively affected by grazing, and this effect was significant 
for bee diversity in 2019. On the other hand, sand prairie bees and forbs responded positively to grazing, and this response was significant in 2019. Okay, so one of the most exciting and difficult aspects of ecological research, in my opinion, is how complex and interrelated all of these systems are. Um, this means that the results of our ecological studies are also complex and difficult to disentangle. Um, given this, I'll do my best to sum up the mumbo jumbo of the last 30 slides in a semi-digestible package. So thank you for bearing with me. Okay, firstly, um, it's evident that uh, from what we saw throughout the summer, um, throughout both summers, that floral cover, which was our proxy for floral abundance, was one of the most important predictors of native bee communities on CRP. And floral cover had a positive effect on many of our bee response measures. Secondly, it does seem that the presence of native flower species plays a really important role in supporting bees on CP25 lands. Thirdly, uh, the effects of grazing were, as we expected, different from ecoregion to ecoregion. Notably, bees on sand prairie fields responded positively to cow grazing. On the other hand, bees on mixed grass prairie CRP fields responded somewhat negatively to grazing. Finally, we only saw the effects of grazing on bees and flowers in 2019, which was the first year following two years of cattle grazing on our CRP fields. Okay, so there are many, many, many potential management implications, but I will do my best to just pick and choose here. Um, I would say preliminarily, we can say that on sand prairie CRP fields, grazing may benefit bee and flower communities. So that's good news. However, on CRP land in the mixed grass prairie ecoregion, um, it may be prudent to approach the introduction of cattle grazing as a mid-contract management option with some degree of caution, given that the evidence um, seems to suggest it could have negative effects overall. Now, given the importance of floral cover to grassland bees, um, it is evidence that increasing floral cover on our CP25 fields and subsequently managing for successful establishment of these floral species would most likely be greatly beneficial to native bee communities. Now, it is important for me to mention that the results I presented here today are preliminary. Um, it's unclear whether the patterns we observed for general level richness and diversity will persist at the species level. Regardless, uh, more research examining native bee responses to grassland restoration efforts such as the CRP should be conducted in order to make effective management decisions for long-term pollination stability. So broad-scale research like ours is pretty essential to understanding the status of native bee communities in compromised landscapes like we see in the Great Plains in the Midwest. Now, our study contributes to baseline estimates of native bee diversity and abundance against which future studies will be able to compare and thus detect um, the extent of potential declines. Most of all, this research proves that bees, bees are indeed utilizing grassland restorations like CRP, so that's great news. Um, given that natural habitat is in short supply throughout Kansas and the Midwest, Continuing to conserve and restore as much habitat as possible is essential to ensuring that native bees persist in these agricultural landscapes. Now, increasing the prevalence of these grasslands, as well as working to understand the best management practices for effective conservation, will only continue to support native bee communities and ensure their long-term persistence throughout the Great Plains. Okay, so uh, before I pass it back over to Rachel. I'd just like to thank the PIs of this project, Dr. Hausman, Dr. Jensen, and Dr. Jameson, as well as our project manager, Molly Reichenborn, and our funding sources, KDWPT and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Additionally, I want to thank the many, 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 many landowners who took part in this study, as well as all of the excellent technicians who made this research possible. 
Um, thank you all so much for tuning in. And with that, I will take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us, Alex. This is just such an incredible project and getting to hear one of the researchers share about the experience and the results from, from what you did. It's just such, such a cool thing. Um, I have a lot of questions for you. Um, okay. <laughs> lots, <laughs> lots of people uh, saying that this is great to uh, lots of bee fluffing comments. Uh, we'll, we'll start with a couple of easy ones. First, uh, Nicole Brown wants to know what your very favorite bee species is or genus if you can't decide species. Oh gosh, that's so hard, Nicole. <laughs> um, well, I, I would I would like to highlight two that are really wonderful. Colletes, if you want to look it up, it's C O L L E T E S. Very, very cute, always fuzzy bees. And we we call them, um, we say that they have heart-shaped faces. Aww. So very appropriate for the recent holiday. Um, I also really love Nomia, which has these um, kind of pearlescent bands on their abdomen that look like, they look like opals essentially. So Amazing. yeah, species I could never decide. Wow. Nicole, I know you're still watching, so I'm counting on you to write those genera down in the comments for us. Thank you <laughs> to make our Google stocking easier. Um, okay, so you also mentioned kleptoparasites a few times, and uh, we were wondering, number one, what are they? And also, why can they indicate high quality bee habitat? That's a great question. So kleptoparasites essentially um, do not provision their own young, so they don't collect a whole lot of pollen, although they do have a lot of hairs on their body still so they can vicariously collect pollen. But they'll wait outside of a, um, you know, a real mom, a hardworking mom's <laughs> nest. And when she goes in and, you know, puts nectar and pollen into the nest and then flies out, our kleptoparasitic bee will fly in uh, very, you know, under the radar they will lay their own eggs inside of the nest and then get the heck out of there before the other mom finds out. And typically, um, this is this is just an overarching statement because there's plenty of different types of kleptoparasites, but that's how it usually works. And, and mom doesn't usually notice there's another egg in there. They're quite small and they're difficult to see. Um, and often that baby will, in its second or third larval instar, either eat the other egg. <laughs> uh, I know it's vicious, but fantastic. Uh, eat the other egg or um, we'll just eat all of the larval provisions so that the other egg doesn't have enough to develop. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. <laughs> right. Oh, and there's a second part to the question. Um, why do they, why do they indicate high quality habitat? Because in order, uh, a lot of kleptoparasites will have one uh, one or two or a handful of bee species that they only parasitize. So in order for there to be kleptoparasites, there has to be enough of that species um, in order to actually have resources for that kleptoparasite to parasitize. So okay. does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, okay. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. I'm trying to find ones that are re related because there, there's quite a few here. Um, Cheryl Miller wants to know what the average lifespan of bees is, are, yes. Yeah, great question as well. Um, I think it, it varies, it, sorry, it varies. It varies depending on the bee species. Um, but we, we would say between a month and three month, uh, three months. Although some like queen bumblebees, uh, they they survive through the winter um, and provision their new nests in the spring. So I, I guess it could be up to a year or so. Okay. I might I might be wrong about the like the longer end of that spectrum. So if anybody has any information and wants to contradict me, please do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um, Laura Mendenhall wants to know, is there an eBird equivalent for bees that we can use to log our bee sightings while out birding? Uh, she's thinking citizen science will be important as more bees are petitioned for listing on the ESA, the Endangered Species Act. 
Oh my gosh, Laura, thank you so much for that question. I really appreciate you looking out for bees while you're also looking for birds. Um, you're, you're a hero. <laughs> uh, I would say that there, there's not a specific bee app in some areas. There is like a, um, a bee atlas that the Xerxes Society is putting together for bumblebees. Um, and they might have some apps, but I generally really like to use iNaturalist um, or Bug Guide, but I love iNat because you can take a picture and upload it later and it'll save it right into the app. And John Asher, who is an excellent, excellent bee research researcher, does a majority of bee identifications for those bees. Um, that being said, not all of your bees will get to species, but I would bet money that John Asher gets them all to genus. Awesome. Thank you. Um, kind of on that end, Julie Rounds was wondering if you could give the full title of the Bees in Kansas publication. I think that was on the slide when you had the Kansas Naturalist publication up. Yes, I believe it's just Bees in Kansas. Um, okay. I actually might have the whole publication right here. No, I do not. I, I, can, um, I can find it or we can go back to that slide. Does that sound yeah. okay? That sounds great, yeah. Okay, let me do that. Uh, although getting out of, I might be clicking quite a bit. I believe it's That's just okay. Bees in Kansas. It was, it was um, published in December of 2019 um, in the, oh gosh. How do I get out of this screen, Rachel? <laughs> um, click, click escape. I did try that. Oh, there oh, it no. is. Okay. Wow, it, it took me right to it, you guys. This is amazing. Um, it's called Bees in Kansas. Uh, the Kansas School Nat School Naturalist did it. Um, that's through Emporia State University, and I'm really grateful to them for putting this publication out because previously there has been no published list of bees in Kansas. So yeah, December 2020. Um, I think I said 2019 earlier, but no, 2020. And uh, if you can't find it, let me know and I will make some inquiries as to whether or not I can pass it along without actually having a subscription to that, um, without you having a su subscription to that journal. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. Yeah. Okay, uh, this isn't really a question, but Mary Liz Jameson said at one point, note that one is sticking out its tongue. And I just thought that was an interesting comment and uh, wondered if that was something that you should be telling us about. <laughs> oh yeah, um, which I'm not sure which one was sticking out its tongue. I think there was a couple of them. Um, yeah, but I think it was on the slide when there was like the four different bees representing the richness. <gasps> oh yes, oh, look at this. Okay, yeah, and Mary Liz, thank you so much for pointing that out. These are some of my favorite pictures. Um, this guy down here is a cavity nesting megachylid, so that's the family bee, and they are considered to be long tongue bees. Um, and this is actually a cactus uh, specialist on the Opuntia flower. So it's got a really, really, really long tongue so it can get all the way down to the nectaries of the flower. Um, and bee tongues are basically like straws that they suck up all the nectar with. It's, really exciting. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Also in related in relation to the last question, um, we have some folks like Bob Gress commenting that uh, you can request a copy of Bees in Kansas from Empor Emporia State's biology department. So um, Perfect. there we go. Cool. Yeah, Thanks, Alex. you should all do that too. So they know how much you love their publication. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, I have a couple of very specific questions about some of the seed mixes now. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, Beverly Corey wants to know who decides what goes into the seed mix for, in particular, CP25, which was the pollinator mix, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and how often is this mix changed? Do you, can you speak to that? Um, I can't speak that much to it. And Bev, I'm so sorry. I really, I really wish I had more information for you. Um, I believe that the NRCS range specialists are the ones um, that make recommendations for the seed mixes. Um, I think it's also primarily decided by what is commercially available. So, you know, we have so many amazing native wildflowers in Kansas, um, but 
such a small percentage of them are actually readily available to farmers at a reasonable cost. So it's, you know, it's a driven by what is in that region um, or what's native to that region. B, who supplies it um, and do they supply a lot of it at a reasonable rate? So NRCS and FSA probably. Um, as far as how frequently they change the mixes, um, I couldn't say. I know that it, I don't think it's changed in the past like five-ish years, but I really should not speak to that because I do not know. So I'm sorry, okay. Bev. I can try to find out for you. <laughs> cool. That's quite all right. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> and um, and uh, there was kind of a, a whole thread of conversation <laughs> going into like people's surprise about some of the results. So sure. I'm going to kind of try to summarize what some of these folks were saying. Um, <laughs> this is an exchange between Beverly Corey, Laura Mendenhall, and then Dan Rogers. And um, they were wondering since CP2 and CP25 didn't really show a significant difference in the floral cover, what could be driving the increase in the bees on CP25? I don't remember which specific set of, set of data that was, um, but maybe you do. Yeah, yeah. So um, that, was, that was why, that goes back to this slide here. So in 2018, we really saw that, that strong effect of CP2 and CP25 on um, on our bee abundance. Um, and like I said, most of our bees in that year were caught on tall grass prairie sites. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, the trends that are happening in tall grass prairie likely going to be driving our overall abundance trends. Um, and I really, I really do think that that's driven by the differences in the, um, the actual species like the flowering form species themselves that were there. So uh, while we didn't see a significant difference in like, you know, total floral abundance or number of species, it's hard to also take into account like the quality of those flowering form species and um, whether or not they're native. That's, those are some, those are you know, just another level of, of fun complexity. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's, I, I appreciate your that question because that's that's a huge one that is not it's not very easy to nail down. So this me saying that I, I think it's because there was more native flowers on CP25 versus CP2 um, is is a guess. <laughs> I right. don't I don't have those results yet, but once I find them out, I will let you all know. And I really appreciate you asking. Awesome. Um, kind of in the same vein of thinking, uh, Dan Rogers wondered if the number of bees collected in the four different regions uh, could be affected by weather or seasonal floral development in that specific region. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Such a good question. That is definitely probably going on. Um, <laughs> we One thing I will say that I'm working on right now is um, because we had so many different aspects to this project and so many sites, um, we were not able to control for weather. And with these, you typically collect them when there's no rain, when the winds are below 15 miles an hour, when the temperatures are above 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So I have cold, two years and X number of site visits worth of weather data. And I am, I will be, um, I'll have to eliminate any of our sites and our samples that were collected when those conditions were not optimal in order to control for those biases. Um, so again, that might completely <laughs> throw things off. So on a, on a, like a day to day basis, yes, weather, absolutely excellent observation. Um, on a greater scale, you know, there are, we have drought years. I believe 2017 was a drought year. We have really wet years. Um, and some people think that bee communities are actually driven by the floral communities of the year before, because those resources were what, um, were what the bees that emerge in the following year were provisioned with. So oh. that is, um, we actually have that data. And that is something that I'm really excited to explore because um, those, previous year floral communities will kind of reflect those weather patterns or the overall, um, yeah, how, how dry it was, um, temperatures, whatnot. <laughs> and, um, and I think that that, I think that that definitely will show some interesting effects on the bees. 
Awesome. Oh, that's so cool. I yeah, can't wait to see question. what happens next. I know, right? It's so exciting. <laughs> okay, I have just two more questions unless anything new comes in. And these are, um, uh, yeah, so good, good, great questions, you guys. This has been so great. Um, <laughs> Beverly Corey wants to know more about some like urban things we could do to help bees. So she says, I have a small suburban yard in West Wichita. What can I plant to be most productive? Oh, that's such a good question, Bev. And thank you for asking because I know that you um, that you actually really want to know and you and you want to go do good things for bees. So I would say find your most local nursery that sources their their seeds locally and um, plant as much diversity as you can for local wildflowers. Um, but don't just plant like uh, diverse in the sense of the number of species. You want to also have um, a some sort of flowering resource available throughout the season. So maybe April through October, if you can find flowers that have different flowering times. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, I would say diversity is is key and as we saw, today abundance is also very key so uh you know if you're limited by the species diversity at least plant lots and lots and lots of of the ones that you can find and you'll be doing lots of good things i really appreciate that bev thanks the bees appreciate it too <laughs> absolutely um this is not one of their comments but following up on that um would you say it's more important to have like a few different things represented or to have like big stands of a smaller number of species? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, bees are attracted to um, clusters of flowers. So if you find one flower in a field that's, you know, kind of off on its own, you're less likely to see a bee on that flower, even if it's a nice juicy one, um, just because it's harder for them to find them. So um, those those UV patterns on flowers are much easier for bees to locate when they're planted in large clusters. So um, I would say if you if you want to cluster your flowers, bees can fly up to a kilometer, sometimes more, um, if they're bigger bodied bees, in order to find their various flower patches. So if you if you if you get to one giant cluster, then you'll be you'll be off to a great start. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. Mm -hmm. There's a question by Dexter that I was debating whether to ask you, but I'm going to spare you the embarrassment and let you go find it in the comments instead. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not easily embarrassed, but. Uh, um. <laughs> well, in that case, uh, Dexter wants to know if you say, if you would say that your phenomenal passion and ridiculously amazing personality is a function of nature or nurture. Oh, Dexter, that is embarrassing. Oh, but you're know, so sweet. I, you. <laughs> I would say I would say it's a function of nature in the larger natural world sense. Like it's very easy um, to to be a happy, interested person um, when you get lots of time outside. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that if that counts, but thank you for the the kind and embarrassing compliment, Dexter. I appreciate it. And that totally counts, especially when you're getting to see and work with cute little bees with fuzzy mustaches and stuff. Oh my gosh, <laughs> the fuzziest. <laughs> uh, okay, well, thank you so much, Alex. That's all the questions we have for you. And I'm gonna let you be finished and sign off for the night. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Our next program is going to be March 16th and we're gonna be having Vicki Sikonek on to talk about prairie chickens and the current status and life history of those birds. So look forward to that presentation. And uh, if you have any further questions for Alex, make sure that you send her any of your questions and comments. And uh, I believe you have her contact information from the other slide. And uh, I will be uploading the recording to YouTube. I'm sorry that it didn't end up displaying on YouTube, but I saw that you guys all made it over here to Facebook. So that's just perfect. I suppose that's all I've got. So thank you guys so much. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful night.